Hello everyone, Matt Desch, CEO of Iridium here. And one of the most fun parts of my job is when I get to interview and speak with people who are users of our network and particularly who have interesting and important applications that uh, ride on the very unique Iridium satellite network. And today I am really pleased to be joined by uh, a very interesting application and, uh, and two people who uh, are part of a very interesting operation called the Monuments Officers. So I'm joined by Dr. Hayden Bassett and William Welsh, who are involved in this activity, which was created a few years ago by the U.S. Army and Smithsonian Museum. Um, they're cultural specialists who help protect important cultural treasures from bombing and looting and during conflicts, as well as other major events. So really a very interesting applications. Uh, by the way, both archaeologist by training, uh, as I understand, um, and uh, which is quite interesting. In fact, uh, Dr. Bassett is the assistant curator of archaeology, Virginia Museum of Natural History, and the curator of their cultural heritage monitoring lab, also research associate the Smithsonian Cultural Rescue Initiative, and an adjunct faculty at the Department of Anthropology at William & Mary. And, and the person, uh, say Hayden, who we were most involved with during this project um, as we were getting this thing going. But Bill, of course, uh, is actually one of the monuments officers directly who is out in the field. And I'm, I think we're going to be interesting to hear about that uh, here uh, in a second. So just to get this started, gentlemen, um, I, I remember the movie back uh, a number of years ago called Monuments Men. I think, um, you know, People remember that with George Clooney and Matt Damon and Bill Murray and all these great stars uh, as they were rec recovering stolen art during World War II, which uh, was interesting. I, I, Monuments Officers is sort of a take up on that now that it's been reconstituted, isn't it? Can you, can you talk a little bit about the history, how this all got started? Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll preface this by saying um, that, you know, Bill, Bill and I are kind of in two different places in that respect. So, um, you know, the, the monuments officers, um, uh, I am I'm in the process of commissioning into the Army Reserves to become an, a monuments officer. Uh, Bill, on the other hand, is is a monuments um, officer, uh, what we call a, a, a six victor. Um, so I'm, I'm going to let Bill take uh, that question. Right. Um, so uh, the the U.S. Army has always been in, involved in uh, in civic stability operations, and the uh, uh, civil affairs branch of, of the Army has the uh, that mission set specifically. <clears throat> the 38 Golf Program is a a development within the Department of Defense to capture civilian expertise that it has no opportunity to grow organically. That heritage and preservation officers are one of those capabilities. Um, the the uh, responsibility for cultural heritage protection has always laden with with civil affairs and the original monuments officer unit is the uh, is the ones that were responsible for that during World War Two. Our mission set uh, as, as it uh, pertains to the modern operational environment is, is very different. Uh, we aren't dealing with a state sponsored looting of a, a continent wide uh, cultural heritage. We deal with international treaties, the obligations there unto. Uh, uh, acute acts of, of vandalism or, or threat, natural disasters, human move, population movements, uh, all sorts of things that threaten cultural heritage. Still, same same general concept, and obviously inspired in the same way. I mean, Hayden, you were in the Navy actually as an archaeologist in the Navy, weren't you? With I didn't even appreciate that actually our armed forces uh, takes archaeology into account really um, in terms of its operations and. What, what it needs to do. I mean, that's a little bit how you got drawn into this a bit, right? Absolutely. So I, I was a civilian archaeologist with the Navy. Um, the Navy, uh, like, you know, all of our military branches has environmental professionals. They have archaeologists. And, and that is kind of, um, you know, counterintuitive to some folks, particularly if you think Navy and archaeology. Um, but if, if you think about, you know, where uh, the Navy is in the world, it's not just on, you know, ships it's it's in you know on in ports it's in on bases and installations all over the world and any time uh the navy or the dod um, or anyone in the u.s government has a footprint in another country uh, we always want to be good stewards and so a big responsibility is making sure that we are not destroying the cultural heritage of another country anytime we build a you know a fence a base a runway you name it so that was my role in the navy and that's kind of one of the motivations 
um, for me, uh, joining initially joining the uh, Monuments program, but also in kind of developing the, some of the methods that we're going to talk about today. Well, I for one am very happy that our armed forces, you know, takes this seriously and and takes archaeology and history and and uh, national treasures and in, into place. And I'm glad you guys are involved in this. Why now? What 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 started the got the monuments officers sort of going again here? I know. Was, remember the Iraqi war and the destruction of, of uh, you know, priceless artifacts there. I imagine there's a lot of these sort of issues that go on around the world. So let's say the, um, you know, so there's several motivations for this. Um, you know, there's several big events that you've just cited, you know, the, um, you know, looting of, of the museum in Baghdad, the, you know, um, bombing in Buddha's um, major events that we can point to for, hey, there was a need uh, for cultural heritage professionals uh, to respond in some meaningful way, to be able to either be on site or be um, in some type of support role in order to, you know, say what comes next and how do we prevent this from happening again. Um, so there's a major need in in that respect in armed conflict, but there's also a huge need um, that's that's growing every single year with responding to cultural heritage threats from natural disaster. Um, so as you can imagine. Um, you know, on an annual basis, more cultural heritage is almost certainly destroyed from major weather events and other natural disasters um, than from armed conflict. And so uh, there's a major mission in, um, you know, the, the Department of Defense, also on the, you know, nonprofit sector with, with us in supporting that role um, in, in being able to identify what cultural heritage around the world is most vulnerable and when disaster does strike. Um, be able to respond in some meaningful way. And that, that really leads to sort of the, the first mission that we worked, um, that we supported you on, which was this mission to Honduras. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that? I know, Bill, you were on the ground there in Honduras. Can you share a little bit about, you know, the experience you had there? Um, what was in, why were you there? What was involved with it? And, um, and how did the monuments officers work there? Absolutely. Uh, so uh, through our through our host nation partners, uh, we identified a need uh, and that need was for the assessment and uh, and, and mitigation of impact from uh, a number of back to back hurricanes that swept through the Honduras, Hurricane Iota and Etta uh, that had had an impact on their cultural heritage. Uh, our role down there was to uh, train uh, both in the classroom and in the field uh, uh, host nation personnel. Uh, in the identification of archaeological sites, the assessment of their condition, and the recordation of any impact that may be ongoing to the site, and then in efforts to mitigate that impact going forward, um, building their capacity to protect their cultural heritage, their awareness of it, and our, our partnership with them in protecting it. Very important, and I imagine there wasn't good cell phone service and a Ritz-Carlton everywhere you went. Um, <laughs> imagine, no. You know, imagine communications and and frankly, just even being out in a remote environment is a uh, uh, is an important aspect of this. Oh, absolutely. So, uh, in in any planning effort, and, and especially one in an area so austere and remote uh, as as the jungles of of Honduras, uh, communication is a major planning uh, factor. Iridium PTT services that we took advantage of, and the handsets uh, that that we had. Uh, made that planning a uh, a non-issue. Uh, being able to count on uh, consistent communications was in a force multiplier and something that we didn't have to think about once we had it conceptually organized. Yeah, so, so um, Aiden, you have one of our um, one of our handsets there. Both uh, that's an Iridium one, I guess. You know, mm -hmm. also have the the ICOM units and everything that were there. I think you were. You were actually communicating with the team down in Honduras, weren't you, at the museum? Um, I mean, and, and actually utilizing the service even, even in a place where there was good cell phone service and that you could connect with them. Uh, how did that work out? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, what the the idea behind this and and where the Iridium partnership was was so valuable is, you know, we are a a support lab. To the institutional partners at the Smithsonian, at you know, to um, the six big, sorry, to the monuments officers on the ground, and one of the key resources um, that we could offer was uh, an entire museum at the touch of a button. So the idea behind uh, 
you know, Bill going down into Honduras, developing these capabilities for future monuments officers missions was that, um, you know, anytime you're in the field and you come across an archaeological site that has been, uh, you know, damaged from erosion, from flooding, um, from, you know, animal tracks, from human traffic, there's not a lot of time uh, in the moments after. Uh, it, typically how we work in archaeology is someone in Bill's position would then have to come back to the States or come back to a major town in Honduras. And then days, maybe weeks later, then we could formulate some type of stabilization effort, some type of response to save an archaeological site. When we had uh, Bill uh, available to us at the push of a button, he could report what he was seeing, both his location and all of the um, damages to an archaeological site. And then we could then in turn provide him with the entire resources of the Virginia Museum of Natural History in being able to come up with a response. And that's not something we can rely on typically with cellular service, as you've just cited, but um, being able to rely on the Iridium Constellation and having that push to talk instant communication with our monuments officers and, and folks in the field uh, is something that is going to be an incredible capability moving forward, uh, just because, um, you know, the it's not all, as you've said, there's, there's not always going to be cellular service. Um, and the, at the end of the day, one thing that we are no, we know we're going to have to rely on is constant communication for that specialized reach back service. Yeah, I've been, uh, I've been doing archeology span for, for two decades and I've never had that kind of support, never been able to, to rely on, on consistent feedback and real time information while I was in the field. Uh, you know, we've all been in that place where where you're lost, your cell phone's out, uh, you you, you want to continue your mission, you know there's a lot of pressure on you, but you can't get any communication. That wasn't a problem in Honduras. With those handsets, I was able to feed information back to the lab, get information from the lab, get information on things I wasn't even reporting on because they were able to see where I was and what I was doing just using those handsets. It was an, It was a capability I've never had before. It is a fairly unique capability. We introduced it, you know, I don't know, six, seven years ago, and it's become extremely popular uh, and continues to be one of our fastest growing services. Just for the people on on this call, it, you know, this is the ability to, unlike satellite phones, which are sort of a one to one connection where you have to dial someone and they answer the phone, you can dial anyone anywhere in the world, but it still requires sort of just a person to person communication. This is a really work group tool. It allows many people as you need in any place in the world uh, to, to literally push a button and all the other people on that talk group hear what's going on and vice versa. And in the case of Hayden, having an ICOM in-building PTT unit so that you could even use it inside a building uh, seamlessly. Uh, everybody hears each other whenever you need it. And I got to believe that that was sort of important for that real time, um, not having to you know, connect one by one. Uh, was, was it a, was it a successful mission, uh, Bill? I mean, was was it viewed as successful by by everyone? Uh, just good first effort. Absolutely. Uh, you know, to your to your first point on the the communicating with the group, uh, we have a we have a distributed workforce. We have uh, an expert in DC that was on that group. We had Hayden at the museum. We had other teams in the field, and we had myself. And then with those work groups set up, I wasn't just communicating with the lab or the other team in the field. I was communicating with everyone all at once. We knew where one another were. We knew what one another were recording. We were getting feedback on the conditions that we were encountering and communicating with four different groups in four geographically disparate places simultaneously and immediately. Uh, it was, a, it was a, a very effective coordinating function in real time. Uh, the mission was an unmitigated success, uh, so much so that we've been invited back to expand on that work and, uh, and, and continue to develop that relationship with very large entities. And, and the, the Iridium handsets contributed tremendously to our success and the projection of that capability to our, our host nation partners. Yeah, this was really meant to be kind of a proof of concept for the reactivated you know, Monuments Officers Program, as I understand it. So. I assume it's been received well by our military partners as well as our our you know global partners there. 
Yeah, absolutely. We're we're uh, we're currently enjoying expanded support, and it was it was so effective that it went beyond a proof of concept to actual in real time mitigation efforts to to harm to that cultural property. Uh, you know what what started out as an opportunity to demonstrate the capability actually turned into a practical cultural property protection exercise. So while while demonstrating these capabilities, we were in fact gathering intelligence, defining site boundaries, identifying site features, and protecting cultural heritage just by being out there and recording it. I think it's great. I mean, uh, in fact, what you guys are doing uh, to protect, you know, cultural artifacts and areas and, and heritage and that sort of thing is, is really important. We love being part of that. I assume you can't really talk about specific missions out in the future, but you know, what would characterize a good mission that, and do you see, how do you see this sort of playing out in the future for the new monuments officers? Uh, a, a good mission is anyone where you protect cultural property. Being out there raising awareness, I mean, it, it, it's inherently positive. Uh, you know, going forward, our measures of success are expanding our projects, expanding our partnerships, expanding our impact uh, in, in the realm of cultural property protection. Uh, and and our, our first run it accomplished all of those goals. We're, we'll be going back again this spring to expand that program even further and, and count on Iridium to provide those communications because they have been so effective. Well, a very unusual and interesting application of our our network and a uh, very important activity you guys are doing. How can our viewers learn more about the museum, you know, the Cultural Heritage Lab and the overall Monuments Officers Initiative? Absolutely. So we are the, um, the Cultural Heritage Monitoring Lab. We are a civil military um, applied research lab. Um, uh, we operate on the civilian side, but if you want to learn more about us, you can visit us on our website. Um, all you have to do is Google Cultural Heritage Monitoring Lab. And if you want to learn more about where we sit here at the Virginia Museum of Natural History, um, you can Google that as well. Uh, we have plenty of information on what we do, um, some of our capabilities, and some of our great partnerships. I think people should do that. And, you know, I assume in the next Monuments movie uh, remake, I, I Bill's going to play himself. I can tell that right now. <laughs> I'm going to be played by John Goodman, I'm pretty sure, again. Uh, but, you know, maybe you can get the George Clooney role, Hayden. I think it's probably going to be the Bill Murray role. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, me too. Uh, anyway, uh, really great talking to you guys. Thanks, thanks so much for sharing this important initiative uh, with our viewers, and good luck in the future with the Monuments Officers. Thanks for, thanks for working with us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, your product makes a difference. I well, appreciate that. Take care. Thanks.